consequences of their rebellion. And I hope that as we look at this, we can reflect on our own lives. Uh, we are in very different circumstances, but there are many analogies, I think, that are going to be instructive for the way that we live our Christian lives. When I was probably in my mid-20s, uh, I was having a conversation with a cousin of mine, his name is Bob, and he is probably about 10 years older than me, and we were talking about raising our children and just the different things that we would do as parents to try to help our kids um, understand the difference between right and wrong and have right behavior and to transfer that behavior from something that's merely outward to a reflection of the heart. And one of the things he said is that there is a memorable phrase that I use all the time with my children, and he's, his children are quite a bit older than mine, so he, doesn't, he, did, he wasn't using it as much then um, as he had in the past. But this phrase, parents listen up, this is a really good phrase, grandparents, great-grandparents, this is a really good phrase, whiners get nothing. Let me repeat that. Whiners get nothing. All right? If your child, your grandchild, your great-grandchild is whining for something, do not give it to them. Do not allow them to train you to give them what they want with bad behavior. It is your responsibility as a parent, a grandparent, or a great-grandparent to train them to have the right behavior and to find that the right behavior brings rewards. That is a little example of what God does in a very broad and honestly catastrophic way in our text and in this, in this chapter this morning. Whiners get nothing. Whiners do not get the thing for which they are whining. Often, they should also get the opposite of what they want so that they find out not only does whining not work, but it brings about consequences that I don't like. The people of Israel, the, the, the word used in, in most of our translations is murmuring or grumbling, right? But it's, it's the adult version of whining, folks. Right? It's the adult version of whining. It, it's, it, it's a lower pitch done not in the, the aisle of the grocery store because I want that sucker, hopefully. But still, we as adults, we crumble. A whining child, a grumbling adult is simply showing fruit. The whining or the grumbling is fruit on the tree of an ungodly life. Hopefully this morning, we can identify some of the roots which give ground to that fruit. And we've been seeing a lot of those roots over the last couple of weeks as we've gone through the first two-thirds of this chapter. This morning we're going to explore how this grumbling turned out, whether or not it worked, if the results were worth the effort. In the context that we are looking at here, God has made a universal statement that we need to hear and internalize. God has said the earth will be filled with my glory. If nothing else happened, that's going to happen. The earth will be filled with my glory. And that is as certain, it is more certain than the sunrise, than the sunset. It is more certain than drawing your next breath. It is more certain than death and taxes. God will bring his glory to this earth. The earth will be filled with his glory. Now, in last week's passage, Moses, recognizing the truth of this, uses that statement of God's and that thing that he knows about God to say to God, if you kill all these people, then the people in Egypt and the people in Canaan are going to say, look, he's a powerful God. He was able to wipe out the Egyptian uh, 
pantheon. But when it came to, to crossing the border into Canaan, he couldn't, so he killed all his people. This is going to be an example, God, Moses says, of people not seeing your glory. So please, please spare them. And we find, we found last week that this was an effective prayer and that God did spare them. The thing is, there are, there are many different ways that God may be glorified. And we'll, we'll see that a little later in the context. God will be glorified among the nations, among all the peoples of the earth. But for those who have claimed God as their God, who have received his blessing, whether it's the people of Israel who received his law and made a covenant with him on Mount Sinai, or us, those of us who've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are the recipients of God's covenant blessings. For those of us who have received his blessing, God requires that we glorify him in another way, through obedience and faith. And if we, after having been exposed to his good works in our lives, Choose instead unbelief and accusation against God like the people of Israel here have done in this chapter, then we are putting ourselves in jeopardy. And especially when we grumble to one another about it or we grumble in the silence of our own heads. God will be glorified by those who claim him. The Exodus generation in this context repeatedly grumbled against him. In the message that we looked at last week, we saw that it was ten times at least. And all of this in spite of his powerful and persistent provision. They should have glorified him through faith and obedience, and they didn't. They had unfaith and disobedience, and thus we have the consequences of this text. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us as we look through this. And then I don't have a typical outline. We're just going to kind of go through this chunk by chunk. Um, I didn't see it lending itself to an outline. So we'll go through this chunk by chunk and make some application as we see the people of Israel. Father, I pray for your grace to us this morning as we look at this text. Please help us not just to see them. Help us to see us. Help us also to be willing to see me in the unbelief that is emblematic here. Please humble our hearts before you. Please give us the joy of repentance, of obedience, and of blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's read verses 26 through 29. Here the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. You hear that? Grumble, grumble, grumble. He uses the word over and over and over again. Make sure that they understand the grumbling is a, is a problem. It's an issue. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward that have grumbled against me. So, God is very taxed with this wicked generation. How long will this wicked generation continue to just spit in my face. After all, what were the works of God for these people? We know them well, right? We got the ten plagues in Egypt that affected the Egyptians and largely did not affect them. They left Egypt and the Egyptians were so, so interested and anxious to see them go that they loaded them with wealth. God guided them through the Red Sea, saving them from Pharaoh's army. And he guided them through many provisions, manna, water, quail, uh, safety from, from those who would have attacked them. <coughs> and there, Mount Sinai, he gave them his law and he arranged with them a covenant, a means whereby they could know just exactly how to please God so that they would be blessed. Every day, they experienced God's provision in manna. Every day they saw a pillar of fire, excuse me, a pillar of cloud 
in the center of their camp or guiding them then to where they should go. Every night there was a pillar of fire in the center of their camp roaring up into the sky. I never get tired of imagining what that would have looked like. And what that would have looked like to, to a nation who could see it in the distance. And whether or not, should we raid them? No, I don't think so. I think, I think we're going to stay away from that sign of God's presence. God had done so much for them. And repeatedly, as God provided for them, they would say to God, okay, fine, you were good enough to do all of that, but are you good enough to do this too? Are you? Come on, let's see. And they taxed him with this over and over and over again until we get to this account. And God says, go in. I have fulfilled my promises to you every time up to this point, and we are on the border of a blessed land. Go in and I will give it to you. I will go before you and drive them out. And they said, no, no. You've been strong enough to do all of that, but you're not strong enough to do this. In fact, you're a bad God. And we're going to reject you and we're going to go back to Egypt because it was better there being slaves. We're going to kill Moses. We're going to kill Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. We're going to choose for ourselves a new leader. And we are going to utterly reject you. Thing is, God had made a covenant with them. And he's like, no, you can't reject me. It's too late. We already made a covenant. I am yours, you are mine, and there's nothing you can do to change that. We're going to find a way to make this work. And God's first way to make this work is, well, I've got four faithful people here, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. I think I'll keep them and kill the rest. And Moses says, no, God, no. Glorify yourself with your mercy. And so God does, and God spares them. We'll, we'll look at the terms of that sparing. How long will this wicked generation be behaving like this? How long will they grumble against me? Now, I don't think that we are in very analogous circumstances to Israel, right? There's no pillar of cloud. There's no pillar of fire. We've got to go to work. You can't just go outside and pick up manna. If you do try to go outside and pick up manna in January, it's going to be wet and cold, but it's not going to be filling. And it's not, what is it? It's snow. We've got different terms upon which we live under God's command. Nevertheless, God has saved us through His Son. He has given us the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. These are promises that He has made and that He is fulfilling in us all the time. And that's just the beginning of what He is doing and has done and will do. We owe Him a greater degree of obedience, a greater degree of devotion, a more passionate pursuit than any in the Old Testament. For we have been given Jesus Christ. If there are obligations that we must consider, then our obligations to God are greater. And yet all too often we do grumble. We are dissatisfied with what God allows in our lives, what God causes to happen to us. We are dissatisfied with our circumstances and we talk about it. We complain and grumble about it in our hearts. We talk about it with the people that are around us. When God sends hard times, when God allows difficulty or inconvenience, our response needs to be faith and obedience, dependence upon God's sovereign control, and a willingness to gain or lose whatever it is He wishes us to gain or lose. Uh, I experienced this in microcosm. I was uh, in, La, in, in La Crosse with my wife and my eldest daughter, and she was hanging out with a friend. And we got to the last thing that we were going to do before our trip home. And I parked the car, stepped out behind the car, and white smoke is pouring out of the tailpipes. And I'm 300 miles from home on a Saturday afternoon. If I start walking, I'm not going to make it here in time for church. Uh, what do I do? Oh, God, I don't need this. And the, the reflex is to begin to grumble. Um, praise the Lord. Uh, I had 
people with me that I wish to teach. <laughs> and so I, I controlled my reactions and said, this is an opportunity to submit to God's sovereign will and to have faith. Um, and so I, I called, I called the, the best expert I know on cars. And he told me, I don't want to tell you anything. I'm scared that what, else, what I'm, sa I'm saying is wrong. <laughs> but after talking it through, we decided, let's try to get home. Drove the whole way home. Not one problem, not a bit of smoke out of the tailpipes. I that doesn't mean that God healed my car. I'm sure there's something going on there that I need to get looked into. But it was an opportunity, a small one, really. An opportunity to not grumble. To not say, God, come on, I don't need this. Apparently I did. <coughs> Do you grumble? When the little things happen? Probably. I know I usually do. I need to stop and sub submit myself to God's sovereign control in my life. Do you look, for those, look at those things and see them as opportunities to depend on Him? Sometimes I think it's more difficult in the little things to not grumble. When the big things happen, when there's real difficulty, tragedy, illness, and death, for me, that throws me out of my resources. And all I've got to do, all I've got is God when things are really bad. And so it's easier for me to depend on Him in those times. But boy, the little times, the little things, that's when I get annoyed. That's when I become disobedient and exhibit unfaith like the people of Israel. Here God promises by his own nature that what he relented from doing in judgment against these people, that is, killing all of them right then, he will do over a period of time, over 40 years. And it's very interesting here. I think we, we are at a bit of a pinnacle in the book of Numbers. After all, we spent a lot of time making sure just exactly who was what age. Just exactly who it is that is 20 years of age and older. And the beginning of the book of Numbers provides us a summary. And I'm certain that there were detailed documents behind the summary documents that we have here in Revelation, which would tell us just exactly who was 20 years of age and older in Judah, in Benjamin, in Issachar, in Zebulun, and in all the other tribes. We have this book of Numbers. We know exactly who is what age. And we get to chapter 14 and we find out why. Moses wrote the record this way because it, is, it was needed to know who it is that was under this judgment. A lot of Christians will ask me, a lot of people will ask me, what do you think the age of accountability is? The age of accountability is when a... Um, a person becomes morally responsible for their sin. And the idea is that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a baby who dies, they had never had an opportunity to repent because they never were of an age to understand their sinfulness. And a lot of people are very worried. What is the age of accountability? And I think, obviously, it's going to be different for different people. Some people never get to that kind of an understanding. There's only one place in Scripture that I know of that actually hints at an age of accountability if... We want to try to decide on an age. And it's here. This judgment is the only place where we've got something like that. Now, I'm not gonna, you're not going to nail me to the wall on this one. I'm not going to say this is the age of accountability. But I think it gives us an idea of God's, the, of the expansiveness of God's mercy. God, is, God, God gave these pe people a lot of time to settle in their character. Now, I am not going to suggest that all the people that were 20 years of age and older were unremittedly sinful now and are in hell after they died in the wilderness. I'm not going to suggest that. It's not that kind of an age of accountability. But if you wish to talk about an age of accountability, you probably have to start here. Um, regardless, I think we see a wonderful example of God's mercy. So he says, um, in the context there, 
but your little ones. Verse, uh, actually, let's go back up to um, verse 30. Not one of you shall come into the land which I swore I would make you dwell, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Um, we're going to take a brief excursion into the structure of Hebrew writing. And I've mentioned things like this before, but in, in Hebrew writing, a lot of times a, a, a shape is used. And you don't see the shape in the Hebrew, but if you understand how Hebrew sentences are constructed and Hebrew phrases are constructed, you can see the shape as you read it. And it's, it's sort of like an hourglass. And things start broad and they come down to a point and then they go back out and are broad again. And whatever it is that's at the point, the, the choke point of the hourglass, that's kind of what the author of that particular section of the Hebrew book that you're reading is trying to make stand out the most. And th these phrases about Joshua and Caleb are at that choke point. Everyone else cannot enter the promised land, but these two who were faithful, who were obedient, they still will come into the land of promise. Uh, in 31 and following, your little ones, which you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies, some translations use, use the word carcasses, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. It's, it's, it's as if they're walking, they're walking dead, not in the contemporary sense of zombies that our culture has become obsessed with. But for all intents and purposes, y'all are dead. You're going to keep going for another 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but you're, you're, you're a walking carcass. And your body is going to fall in the wilderness because of your unbelief, because of your disobedience. Um, your dead bodies will fall in the wilderness and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and shall suffer, suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lie in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. And there's some irony in here. Previously in the context, the complaint that the people of Israel brought against God is, you brought us out of Egypt into the wilderness, and you about killed us in the wilderness. Now we're to the edge of the promised land, and we are certain that if we go in there, we're going to be slaughtered, and our families, our wives, and our little ones will become prey. They will become slaves in the promised land, because those guys are so big, and they have such high city walls, and we're so small, and our God isn't strong enough. God says to them in a very ironic way here, what you accused me of doing, I'm going to do to you. And I'm going to allow your children, who you said would be prey, I'm going to empower them to not be prey. I'm going to empower them to enjoy the promised land. The adult sin made for 40 years, half a lifetime of homelessness for their children. This is a horrible consequence of unbelief, of grumbling. Verse 35 is a final kind of a summary statement. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. People who grumble are under God's displeasure. People who grumble are under God's displeasure. We have been given Jesus Christ. We have been given the Holy Spirit. We have been given blessings that are not, it's not possible to calculate them, to stack them up and compare them with anything. We have been given God's pleasure, God's favor. We've been declared blessed through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, in such a way that we have no reason to grumble unless we are full of unbelief and disobedience. And so, brothers and sisters, let us not grumble. And let us encourage one another to not grumble. How do you do that? <laughs> well, sometimes it takes a slap in the face. Sometimes it's straight-up confrontation. Stop grumbling. Think of the things that you do have. Count your blessings, right? Sometimes it's a little more subtle. Non-participation. 
occasionally is enough. Someone grumbles at you and you respond by looking them right in the eye and not saying a thing. That's beautifully awkward. <laughs> Change the subject. What if God has something in store through this? Oh, hang on. God is sovereign. It's not what if. Since God has something good that he will bring about through this, let us respond with faith, not grumbling. So let us be helping one another because those who grumble have God's displeasure. 36 through 38. And the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against them by bringing up a bad report out of the land. The men <laughs> who brought up a bad report out of the land died by plague before the Lord. Of those men who went out to spy the land, only Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive. And so that thing that God said to Moses, I'm going to do this and only four of you are going to be left, or maybe those four in their families seems more likely, that didn't happen to the whole congregation. But God showed the whole congregation that what could have happened to them does happen to these. 39 through 45 is sad. When Moses told these words to the people of Israel, they mourned greatly. The difference between a growing Christian and one who is full of unbelief is that a growing Christian mourns for their sin before the consequences. An immature Christian mourns for their sin only because of the consequences. And with this people of God, it's the same way. They mourned greatly, not because of their sin, but because of the consequences. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the heights of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We'll go up to the place the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. But Moses said, Why are you now transgressing the command of the Lord? When that will not succeed, because God had told them um, in verse 25 of this, of this chapter to leave, to go away. Do not go up, for the Lord is not among you, lest you be struck down before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned back from following the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Hear that? Might be the most tragic phrase of the chapter, right? Because you have turned back from following the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them even to Hormah. This is an example of how not to respond to God's discipline, to be sure. How can we avoid doing the present day version of this? How can we avoid this? Because this is, this is really bad news. This is a tragic chapter. Well, I think that we need to remember the works of God. Because the works of God will help us along the way to faithful obedience. We need to remember the works of God because the works of God will help us along the way to faithful obedience. And when I say remember, I don't just mean remember. Uh, I mean to memorialize, to find a way to make that memory large and shiny in our lives. Uh, we have this memorial that we observe this morning. Maybe as an example of that, a commanded memorial. But are there times in your life when God has done something significant? I'm going to guess yes. <laughs> Have you a memorial of that? When a number of my children were baptized, we gave them a piece of jewelry, a bracelet, or a ring to wear to memorialize that event so that whenever that would be noticed, they would remember the good thing that God had done for them in saving them and bringing them to a place in their life where they wish to obey him. There are lots of different things that we can do. A plaque on the wall with a story of what God has done. And the list could go on. Memorialize. Not just remember, but memorialize the works of God in your life because they will help you along to faith and obedience. 
I think we also see in this passage wonderful signs of God's mercy. The adult sin certainly produced consequences for their children, but it did not disqualify those children from blessing. God expressed judgment, certainly, but he was also merciful. We have those passages, um, and one of them is in, in, the, in the immediate context, we looked at it last week, where God says, I will, I will cause the sin of the parents to reach out until the third and fourth generation. And I think that immediately in the context of that statement, we see what God means by that. It does not mean that those children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren lose opportunity to be blessed by God. It does mean that consequences, the consequences of my lack of faith, will affect my children. The consequences of your disobedience will affect your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. They will. That doesn't mean that they're disqualified from blessing. How did God use the consequences of the parents' sin to benefit the next generation that did enter the promised land? They crossed that Jordan River and they disabled themselves at God's command for about two weeks. Then they went and marched around Jericho. Maybe they felt like the fool that God caused those walls to come down. And they, almost to a unit, pursued him in obedience as we get to the end of the book of Joshua, we see the, the, the warriors from the tribes who were living across the Jordan River crossing and going back home after years of war and building an altar there to memorialize the works of God like I just talked about. And the large part of the nation of Israel looked across and said, are they already doing idolatry? We've got to do something about this. Either we have to reconcile this or we have to kill them. There's no way that we as a nation can deal with faithless disobedience again in this generation. Our parents did it. We're not going to do it. And so they said, come on. What's going on? Come live in my backyard. If you're going to be idolatrous because you're over there on that side, come live in my backyard. Take some of my land. Take some of my property. We've just got three doors here. One, come live with us so you can be faithful to God. Two, explain to us that you will be faithful to God over there on the other side and that altar isn't idolatry. Or three, we're going to come over there and kill you all. The next generation was desperately interested in holding on to God's blessing. And I think 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, hearing their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and uncles tell them, we're here because we failed to obey. We're here because we didn't have faith. Don't make the mistake, son, that your father made, that your grandfather made. God is good. Just look at the manna every morning. Look at the pillar in the middle of the camp. God is strong. Trust in God. Never turn your back on him. It's more important to have him than anything else. Four decades of that produced a generation that wasn't perfect, but surely a generation that was afraid. Afraid to go on in unbelief. So we need to remember God's mercy. Even the consequences are taken up by God and made so that all things work together for good.